Hey, so this is a game I was hoping to make a video about a long time ago now. Like, nearly a year and a half ago I think was the original idea. But even if Sonic Forces is pretty irrelevant by now, with Team Sonic Racing and that one movie coming up, now might be a bad time to revisit Forces and explore its place in the series. Sonic Forces was a pretty contentious entry into the Sonic series. Vastly overshadowed by Sonic Mania, and generally considered yet another blunder of the modern Sonic line of games, Sonic Forces wasn't exactly received with thunderous applause on its release. Unlike Sonic Mania, Sonic Forces is another release developed by Sonic Team, who most recently put out Sonic Generations, which was relatively well received but very short, and Sonic Lost World, which was a bit weird and not very popular. So when Sonic Forces was announced, people were a bit divided on what to think of it. On one hand, it was pretty clear from the start that the game would be extremely similar to the generally well-liked Sonic Generations. And the first trailers led a lot of people to speculate that Forces would be a return to the more narrative-driven style and tone of the Sonic Adventure games, as opposed to the more goofy slapstick style of Colors or Lost World. For me, the fact that they were seemingly trying to make Sonic Generations again was less of a selling point and more of a sign that they were desperate to grab the attention of the fanbase. Not to mention Sega's rather unsubtle usage of Sonic Mania as a platform to encourage people to buy Sonic Forces, with the game's ending being a clear tie-in. The gameplay footage they released didn't do wonders for my confidence either. When I was watching it, all I could think about was how monotonous and frankly boring it looked to play. And the game's Japanese demo only let you play for all of 60 seconds before ending gameplay and kicking you back to the main menu. I think it goes without saying that this is not something you do if you're confident in the game you're putting out. Not to mention some of the music they'd released, the sensation of listening to I can only compare to a dentist taking an ultrasonic scaler to your teeth. In the lead up to its release, my personal expectations for Sonic Forces were pretty low, but in the process of playing through it, I've actually developed a bit of a complicated relationship with it. Turns out the game does have its virtues, but it's definitely not all good news either. My feelings for Sonic Forces are very mixed, so let's take a look back at this game nearly a year and a half later and see what we think about it. Or what I think about it, mostly. Let's get the basic gameplay out of the way first. Sonic Forces has three playable characters, Sonic, Sonic, and your persona. The game's levels are split between each of these three characters, as well as levels where modern Sonic and your OC team up, and you kind of play as both of them at the same time. Each character has its own unique style of play, so I'm going to go through them one by one, starting with modern Sonic, since he's the first one you get to try out. Modern Sonic plays pretty similarly to how he did in Sonic Generations. Much like in Generations, modern Sonic has two distinct kinds of gameplay, 3D and 2D. He alternates back and forth between each throughout the level, with each of the two modes having its fair share of problems. Modern Sonic's gameplay is what people in the Sonic fanbase have taken to calling boost gameplay. This is because more often than not, you'll be holding down the boost button to blast through the levels, chaining together homing attacks on enemies and obstacles as you go. Simple as it is, zooming through the levels and smashing up robots is actually reasonably fun. But the experience might sour a bit once you start to realise how little play there actually is in the gameplay. The experience of playing modern Sonic, particularly in 3D, is an extremely on-rails one. Even the most basic turns seem to require special scripting on the map level to actually make Sonic follow them. There's one particular turn in the game where this scripting is a bit wonky, and the consequences of that are pretty plain when you see Sonic fly off the edge of the course if you come at it too fast. If you make the mistake of thinking about it too much, it makes you realise how little control you actually have over Sonic as the player. You might even start to consider if this kind of high speed twisting and turning boost gameplay might have some inherent flaws to it. The occurrence of scripted speed ups and very unsubtle invisible walls add to the feeling of lacking control. Modern Sonic's 2D gameplay has its own series of problems. Because there's one fewer dimension at play, the game doesn't tend to need so much of the in-level scripting to stop Sonic flying off the map. You'll still probably spend most of your time with your finger on the boost button, smashing effortlessly through enemies that seem like they're not even there, or chaining together homing attack after homing attack. The 2D sections do add a bit of platforming into the mix, which is a welcome change. Unfortunately, the 2D platforming also misses the mark in a lot of areas. For one, controlling Sonic in 2D is a bit of a nightmare. 
I lost count of the amount of times I fell to my death due to how much the length of your jumps is influenced by your speed. The tiniest amount of velocity can be the difference between massively overshooting your desired landing point and barely making it halfway there. What makes matters worse is that you have virtually no mid-jump maneuverability, meaning if you over or undershoot your jump, there's pretty much no way of coming back. The platforming segments were also just kind of boring and a bit poorly designed at points. There was very little of the variety and creativity I'd hoped for from a Sonic the Hedgehog game. Classic Sonic's gameplay was a serious letdown. You'd think with Sonic Mania being a thing, Sonic Team would have stepped up their game in this area, but it becomes obvious pretty quickly that that's not the case. The movement physics are poorly done, and even feel like a step backward from Sonic 4 Episode 2. The level design is boring, uninspired, clunky and irrational, and overall this just pales in comparison to the classic style gameplay we got from Sonic Mania. They went as far as to copy the drop dash move from Mania, but couldn't take any cues from Mania's physics, controls or level design? Classic Sonic controls are a fair bit better than modern Sonic, but not enough to save making every careful jump stressful and taking most of the fun out of the platforming. And seriously, lose the boost pads. It's just a lazy way to avoid having to design good levels and cover up the fact that you've done a shoddy job at replicating classic Sonic's gameplay. The third character in Forces is the Avatar, a customizable character you can deck out with your choice of accessories and gadgets. The Avatar plays very similarly to modern Sonic, except they can't boost and instead have access to an arsenal of weapons they can use to mow down enemies and navigate through stages. These are called Wispens, and you can only equip one at a time from the character customization screen between levels. You start off with the Fire Wispen, but you gain access to more as you progress through the game. Each Wispen has a combat ability to wipe out enemies and a mobility function that you can only use when you find your Wispen's corresponding Wisps in a level. For example, the Fire Wispen lets you use a flamethrower for fighting enemies and gives you a burst power to boost yourself upward to collect shit floating in the air, and the Lightning Wispen gives you a Lightning Whip weapon, as well as the ability to fly through trails of rings. These are the first two Wispens you get, and to be honest, they're some of the better ones. A lot of the Wispens are just objectively better than others, and a lot of the mobility functions are far too risky and unpredictable to be worth using in most situations. The Avatar's wire attack is basically just a reskin of Sonic's homing attack, though perhaps a touch slow. So the only substantial difference between the Avatar and Modern Sonic is swapping out boosting for the Wispen powers. In the levels where you play as Modern Sonic and your Avatar together, it's essentially just like playing as Modern Sonic but with access to Wispen powers. That, or playing as the Avatar but with the ability to boost. There's also this ability called the Double Boost which activates at predetermined points in the level. It puts on a big show but it's ultimately just a pretty shallow gimmick. You just mash buttons a lot and then go really fast for a while. The only input you can make during the boost is to move left or right a little bit. This ability is one of the more egregious examples of Sonic Forces style over substance gameplay. The character customization for the avatar left a lot to be desired. When you create your character, you get to choose your character's gender and then choose between seven different kinds of animals, each with its own unique passive ability. Much like with the Wispens, it can be said that some of these are pretty much objectively more powerful than others. The cat ability, for instance, pretty much makes it nearly impossible for you to die in most situations. After you pick your gender and animal, you can choose from three basic head shapes for each animal gender combo. Then you can select from a handful of different options for eyes. From there, all you're really left with is to pick a fur, skin and eye colour, as well as a voice and a victory pose. For a start, this is the most you can customise your avatar. You can unlock more clothes and accessories for them by playing through the game's levels, as well as clearing missions, which we'll get to later. Honestly, the amount of customization available right off the bat was a bit underwhelming. Things like a few more eye options, the ability to select ear and mouth colours separately, have skin coloured arms like Sonic's or Amy's, and the ability to customise the belly torso bit Sonic characters seem to have would have gone a long way. As you start going through the game and unlocking things, you'll notice that there are lots, and I mean lots, of clothing and accessory items. You'd think this would be a good thing, but unfortunately it's not as great as you might think, and this is for a couple of reasons. One problem is that a huge portion of the unlockable accessories are too garish, ugly, niche or themed to be useful for most character designs. There's a big focus on goofy and brightly coloured costumes and other stuff that's very difficult to coordinate with other accessories to create an appealing look for your avatar. The other main problem is that once you start to build up a large catalogue of accessories, it becomes very tedious to scroll through your inventory to find the ones you want. There's no category system, no search bar, and no way to sort things by colour or any other variable. Too often finding the item you want becomes an exercise in frantically scrolling down until it comes up. The customizable character thing was a decent idea and could have been a real treat to play around with if more cues had been taken from other games with great character customization systems. 
But in the end, the character customization just becomes yet another aspect of Sonic Forces that could have had potential if just a bit more effort was put into thinking it through. The bosses, for the most part, are pretty fun to fight, though the game's frustrating 2D controls make a couple of them less fun than they could have been. On the bright side, the boss fights are impeccably unique and varied, with no two bosses being alike or even remotely sim- Hold on a second. Trying to pull a bit of a sneaky one there. Bet you thought I wouldn't notice. To the game's credit, there are still five unique boss fights, and even the copy-paste bosses still have unique elements to them that add a bit of a twist to the fight each time. There was one other thing that bothered me about the boss lineup. The game's story makes a big show about how Infinite is using clones of four former adversaries of Sonic. Metal Sonic, Chaos, Shadow, and Zavok. Early in the game you fight against Zavok, and a bit later you play the copy-pasted Metal Sonic boss fight, but fights against the Shadow and Chaos clones? non-existent. The game even sets up like you're gonna get to fight both of them in cutscenes before they're unceremoniously kicked in the face. It just seems so blatant with the opening cutscene and the promotional material for the game that you get to fight all four characters at some point. But nah. Screw setting expectations and then living up to them, I suppose. So, let's talk about the story of Sonic Forces. I'm not holding anything back as far as spoilers go, so keep watching only with that in mind. The game opens with a short cutscene of Eggman gloating about his amazing new creation, Infinite. His minions, Orbot and Cubot, make sure to remind us in the audience that this one is gonna be serious this time. Just like you guys wanted, right? It doesn't take long for us to get to see Infinite in action. After a short introductory level with Modern Sonic, another cutscene plays where Infinite shows up, along with duplicates of Shadow, Zavok from Sonic Lost World, Metal Sonic, and Chaos from Sonic Adventure. We then get to watch the five villains kick the shit out of Sonic while Tails fumbles around with his iPad. The cutscene ends with Sonic collapsing to the ground, defeated. That's pretty dark, right? The unstoppable Sonic the Hedgehog finally got his ass handed to him. Imagine what would happen afterwards. <laughs> well, funny about that, you are going to have to imagine it, because all the game has to offer of the fallout of Sonic's defeat is some white text on a black background explaining what happened next. With this, Sonic Forces has pretty egregiously broken a time-old rule of storytelling. Show. Don't. Tell. After this, we meet the resistance team that formed after Sonic's... uh... Defeat. As it turns out, Sonic Team finally found a way to do what fans were asking for and add more characters into the game, without the hard work of actually giving them significant roles in the plot. Don't get me wrong, there is a plot in Sonic Forces, and it isn't all bad. There is a coherent narrative there, and while it's a bit lacking in dynamicness... dynamicity? It's decent enough, at least by Sonic game standards. It mostly revolves around the two Sonics and the Avatar teaming up to take the world back from Eggman, by finding a way to nullify the Phantom Ruby's power and thereby disable Infinite. The other characters in the Resistance tend to mostly act as exposition and to explain the missions you undertake to you. They also play a role in game. Kind of. Now, what good video games tend to do is to integrate their stories into their gameplay, making for an engaging experience that gets the player invested in both. Sonic Forces kind of attempts to look like it's doing this. As you run through the levels, you'll see radio transmissions from Resistance members in the top right corner of your screen. These messages attempt to provide a kind of narrative to the level you're playing and give you a sense of what the Resistance is up to while you're running around and smashing badniks. You'll get transmissions to let you know they're doing stuff like fighting giant robots or that troops are scattering or getting caught in enemy crossfire, that sort of thing. You don't actually get to see any enemy crossfire or troop scattering in-game. You're just meant to kind of imagine it's happening while you play. It would have been really cool and immersive to actually see this stuff happening as you blast through the levels, but they weren't willing to commit to that, and as such the transmissions add very little to your experience. One of the big issues with the game's writing, which I found equal parts frustrating and downright hilarious, is the fact that the game can't seem to decide on the tone it wants to go for. Right off the bat, when Sonic has his ass kicked by Infinite, we're expected to believe that, as far as the members of the Resistance are concerned, Sonic is dead. Yeah, not missing in action or anything like that. D-E-D, -E -D, dead. Obviously we, as the player, probably aren't supposed to think Sonic's gone for good, but the characters in the game? They believe it. We get a glimpse into a world where all Sonic's wacky, colourful friends have to deal with the fact that their lifelong comrade has been slain in battle and they'll never see his shit-eating hedgehog grin again. Given the goofy, light-hearted slapstick tone we've come to expect from Sonic recently, this is pretty out of the left field. 
and the game has no self-awareness about this whatsoever. And it's hysterical. Resistance in the city is reporting that whatever it is that finished Sonic... Sorry, I'm still not used to saying that. Wait, finished? They won't even say the word. They went to all the trouble of pretending to kill off Sonic to make their game seem dark and edgy, but they won't even say the word killed. I still dream that Sonic is with us. Do you think he might be? I'm an optimist, but I'm also a realist. Sonic is gone, Amy, and Tails is... Tails has just lost it. God, apparently Tails has gone mad from grief. Oh wait. He's fine. So, how does the whole dead Sonic problem get resolved, you might be wondering. Well... I've just received some incredible news! Sonic is alive! Oh, problem solved. That didn't take long. He's captured in the orbiting prison. My spy there says he's in a solitary confinement cell, and they've been torturing him for months. Oh, tortured? Has Eggman been fucking waterboarding him or something? Good god, after all those months of torture, Sonic's probably not gonna be much like himself anymore. Going through something like that would damage anyone's spirit, compromise anyone's faith in the inherent goodness of human- Oh, wait. He's fine. Yeah, so this weird dissonance between trying to be dark and gloomy and not at the same time is a recurring theme in the game's writing. Apparently, Tails going insane and Sonic being tortured were not present in the original Japanese script. So my guess is that the American writers decided to ram those things in in a kind of misguided attempt to pander to the section of the fanbase that wanted a more serious story. But seriously, this just doesn't work. All of my recent exposure to Sonic has trained me to think of him and his pals as goofy goofy goobers who go on fun adventures and spout wacky one-liners. Seeing them all of a sudden talking about war and pain and torture like this, I just can't take it seriously. He's been torturing him for months. I can't really talk about the game's story without talking about the secondary antagonist, Infinite, for a bit. He's a very odd fellow, to put it lightly. He likes to go on a lot about stuff like pain and suffering and destruction, you know, fun stuff like that. I gotta admit, he's a very fitting villain for the story. Like the story itself, I'm never quite sure whether I'm supposed to be taking him seriously or not. I'll be talking a bit more about him later, because he gets a bit more attention in some of the DLC. Towards the end of the game, the Avatar is able to use a prototype Phantom Ruby dropped by Infinite to nullify his powers. You then face off against Eggman in a three-stage boss fight. After that, the battle is won. Classic Sonic is presumably murdered by Thanos, the rest of the Resistance take up the task of restoring the world, and modern Sonic runs off into the sunset. Eggman's fate is kind of left up to interpretation. A lot of the awkward questions left unaddressed by the ending are actually answered in a sequel comic by IDW, which is actually pretty decent. Too good for the game it's based on, I think. The free Episode Shadow DLC adds a second but much shorter prequel campaign to the game. In it you play as Shadow the Hedgehog through more difficult modified versions of three modern Sonic levels. It also serves as something of an origin story for Infinite. The DLC reveals that Infinite was once a mercenary hired by Eggman to defend one of his bases. After losing a fight with Shadow, which, like our fights with Chaos and Shadow in the main campaign we only get to see in cutscene form, Infinite's ego is clearly a bit worse for wear. It's this humiliating defeat that leads him to allow Eggman to experiment on him and bestow him with the power of the Phantom Ruby. Learning that the reason Infinite is such an edgelord is because he's an egotistical loser on a power trip with a fragile sense of masculinity made me appreciate his character just a bit more. Not a lot, mind, but a bit. Even with the new backstory, Infinite's still not a terrific character, but without it, he's just a downright terrible one. Episode Shadow gives insight into a fair few things the main story seems to gloss over. Not just why Infinite is such an edgy dipshit, but also stuff like how Omega got smashed up and why Shadow seems so familiar with Infinite in the main story. The context it provides is really indispensable and I think having it as an optional bonus campaign instead of integrating it into the main campaign was a mistake. I reckon it could have been implemented as a series of flashback levels after you meet up with Shadow for the first time. That way it could have fleshed out the plot and extended the length of the game at the same time. 
As an added bonus, downloading Episode Shadow lets you play as Shadow in some of the main game's modern Sonic stages. I did a quick count, and it turns out you can only use him in about half of those stages, which is a bit disappointing. I suspect this is for technical reasons, as the levels where you're not allowed to use Shadow tend to be the ones with animated sequences which would require some extra work to make them work with Shadow. Feels a bit lazy, but I guess half is better than none. Another bit of free DLC you can get is the Super Sonic DLC, which lets you play as the super forms of modern and classic Sonic in most of their stages. Funny story though, this DLC wasn't always going to be free. When the Supersonic DLC came out, the original plan was for it to be free for the first month, and then for it to become a 2 US dollar purchase from then on. After relentless pressuring from the fanbase, Sega eventually caved and decided to make it free forever. Frankly I have no idea what made them think charging money for Supersonic was a good idea in the first place, instead of, you know, letting him be an in-game unlockable like in every other Sonic game. I mean, we all know what made them think it was a good idea, but still. There's not really too much for me to say about Sonic Forces graphics. The texture quality is a bit poor at times, but that doesn't matter much when you're moving too fast to pay much attention to things. Other than that, the game looks generally pretty good. The level motifs are eye-catching and interesting with good attention to detail. The quality is just a touch inconsistent and could do with some generous polishing. In spite of their flaws, more often than not, Sonic games tend to have pretty decent soundtracks. The Sonic Forces soundtrack, unfortunately, is a bit of a mixed bag. There are some decent tunes mixed in there, but it's still a bit hit or miss. Thankfully, the sample of the Green Hill music I gave you the pleasure of listening to at the start of this video is probably the most offensive example. Actually, Sonic Forces comes through with an overall reasonably solid soundtrack. If it were up to me, I'd probably tone down the synths and make it sound less artificial, and scrap some of the more grating songs, but the soundtrack is by no means a bad one. Playing through the story campaigns isn't all Sonic Forces has to offer. You'll also regularly see what are called SOS missions pop up on the world map on levels you've already completed. There are three kinds of these and each has its own twist. Red SOS missions have you take control of what's called a rental avatar, which is a randomly selected avatar downloaded from someone else's game. To complete the mission you just have to beat the level without dying. If you die, you fail the mission. Green ones are pretty much the same, except you're able to swap between the rental avatar and your own avatar as you play. The blue ones are a bit different in that they can appear in modern and classic Sonic levels as well as avatar levels. In these ones, as well as completing the level without dying, you also have to free an avatar from a capsule partway through the level. Even if they don't really shake up the gameplay all that much, the SOS missions are still a welcome addition because they give you a slight incentive to replay levels that you might never touch again otherwise. Clearing SOS missions is also one of the things you can do to work towards clearing missions. That's right, missions. As opposed to SOS missions. Two completely different things in Sonic Forces, and the terminology isn't confusing at all. So, missions are objectives you can clear in the game to unlock more accessories for your avatar. These can be things like clear five SOS missions, clear a certain stage within a certain amount of time or with an S rank, defeat a certain number of enemies with a certain Wispin, and so on. There are also some pretty inane ones like boost in a Sonic stage or spin dash in stage 18, which I think the game could really do without. There are also daily missions missions, which instead of giving you accessories, give you XP bonuses to help you level up your avatar faster. I haven't mentioned the avatar leveling system until now because it doesn't really have any kind of important impact on anything. Basically, you get XP from beating levels, and at each level up you get a new medal. The medals don't do anything by themselves, but by collecting them you can complete the missions which require you to get a certain number of them, which you then get rewarded with accessories for completing. Seems a bit unnecessarily convoluted if you ask me, but I digress. I like that the missions are there to do if you want to, because it gives you a lot more to do with the game and drives you to dive into everything it has to offer. Sonic Forces also has five red star rings hidden in each level. These give you additional incentive to replay levels and take different paths through them that you might not have thought to the first time. Sonic Forces also has extra unlockable levels called Secret Stages and Extra Stages. All of these play in 2D and are very short. The secret stages unlock as you play through the main story, and the extra stages unlock as you collect red star rings. All in all, there are a total of 15 unlockable levels. None of these are as fun or well made as the main levels, but more content to play around with is always a good thing. In addition, collecting all the red star rings in a given level lets you instead collect number rings, which are placed in close proximity to each other and need to be collected in the right order. Then if you replay the level again after getting those, you can collect silver moon 
moon rings instead, which have to be grabbed within a short time limit after getting the first one. As far as I'm aware, you don't unlock anything for collecting the number rings or silver moon rings, but completionists will appreciate having even more stuff to collect. So, Sonic Forces. Honestly, in spite of how ruthlessly it probably seems like I've torn it to shreds, it isn't really that bad. It's just not very good either. It comes onto the stage with good presentation and some very novel concepts, yet fails to execute to its fullest potential on pretty much every front. So, some good things about the game. It's presented well. The menus in HUDs are cool and the different environments you play in are as creative and colourful as you'd expect from a Sonic game. The soundtrack is also pretty decent. It took some risks. Being set in a world dominated by Eggman was a different direction as far as Sonic stories go, and while the execution could have been a hell of a lot better, it still helps forces stand out from Sonic's other adventures. The ability to make your own custom character was also a very unusual move for a Sonic game, but also another that set Sonic Forces apart from other Sonic titles. Honestly though, it didn't really feel worth it in the grand scheme of things, and I'd personally rather see someone like Tails or Knuckles be playable in future titles. If you enjoyed playing through Sonic forces, then there's lots of stuff to do after you finish the main story. Things like the missions, red star rings, bonus stages and DLC will help you get a lot more out of the game, especially if you consider yourself something of a completionist. Unfortunately, the handful of virtues Sonic Forces has doesn't quite save it from being a mediocre game. The core gameplay is still flawed, particularly the handling and controls. And at the end of the day, there's not much that can save a game from bad controls. The 3D parts are fun and feel pretty smooth, at least as long as you follow the game's script. The 2D parts though, just handle like shit. I feel like tweaking the controls in 2D is something that would have made Sonic Forces a lot more enjoyable for me. Overall, neither the game design or the writing are particularly great, and even with some good ideas with lots of potential at their core, Sonic Forces still fails to deliver in both design and execution. So, with both the good and the bad in mind, I've decided to give the game a score of 3 stars. So this video has been a long on and off process over the past few months, so if it seems a bit scrambled and incoherent, then that's probably why. So if you've watched this thing all the way through, then thanks. Uh, I've got some more content in the works that's going to be a little bit different to what I've done so far, so keep your eyes peeled for that. And until then, I'll see you later.